Uh, are we good? Okay. All right. Well, let's see. Um, it's actually uh, something a little new for me. And uh, so I, uh, first, I want to say, Buju Nini Wang, Mani Dog. Hello, my friend and relatives. Bangi Tago Nini Ta Anishina Bem. Uh, I, I speak very, very little uh, Ojibwe. Idash in uh, but I'm going to try to introduce myself in the language. Um, Francois Medion, with uh, the Indigenous uh, in France, I was named Francois Medion. Back uh, in Ojibwe and in Ojibwe country, uh, some people call me uh, the baker. Um, um, Oniga means sing in Dunjiba Nungom, and today I live in Duluth. Uh, the uh, in uh, Oniga Minsing means a little portage. Uh, there are different names for Duluth depending if you live down on the bottom of the portage or on the hills on top, or it's uh, Misa Bekong, the place of the giants. So uh, I just wanted to say hello, everybody, uh, that way, and uh, good evening. And I want to thank you for. Uh, 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 being here, you know, taking time out and uh, for your interest in the earth, ni mama aki or gi mama aki, yours. Um, say my prayer tonight uh, for uh, uh, each and every one here is uh, that you might hear, see, or taste uh, something good that you can take home with you. Um, <clears throat> and uh, before uh, I go on with uh, 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 talking about compost and do the presentation. I want uh, uh, say thank you for the food, uh, all the one that uh, you know had a hand in it. Um, to everyone that made that possible here tonight too. You know I have the, this place. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to Erica. She's not here, but uh, you know, she is a big part in that the uh, Food Sovereignty Team, um, and then uh, everyone at uh, 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 Natural Resources, uh, at the uh, Environmental Institute, uh, and uh, the new Ag Department here. Um, uh, so I say again, you know, Chimigwech Anishinaabe Aki Nungum, Miigwech Nagachi Wanong Nijiwag. And I'm going to mention, I'm not going to take too much time, but I still want to mention a couple people. They can't hear you online. Oh, they can? Nope, so I'm just going to try something. Okay. Is it too low or? Uh, oh, okay. No, you have to mute it. Maybe this one. This one. Okay. Okay, good? good? Yep. All right. All right. Um, just a couple more things before we get into the, uh, you know, the call and stuff. But uh, um, uh, there's uh, a couple of people that uh, I feel that uh, I'm sitting there shoulders, you know, giants uh, from the front lap. And, and uh, uh, they, they have moved on and they passed on, but they actually uh, um, uh, made it possible for us to be here tonight. And, and uh, um, one, one of, uh, of them, my, my friend, she initially began the uh, author uh, from, uh, from the uh, Fond du Lac uh, uh, the, the other, other person, person I want to mention is Okitiba Abanakwada Victor Swan, who was a First, first Nation uh, 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 singer for excellence. And then, and then uh, uh, the last person, person I want to mention, mention today, today uh, has, he has a had a big role in bringing us all together. Um, um, his name is uh, Lila Ndidib. Uh, uh, he's uh, uh, the, the, the man that created and grew the uh, Diddy on program here on Formula, you know, and, uh, and made him like, 
almost 20 years ago when I got here, you know, when I started attending this kind of class 20 years ago. Uh, uh, yeah. And then the villain was there back then. He's the one that made that possible. So I just wanted to mention that and the thank you, you know, acknowledgement of uh, uh, everyone like that. And then uh, uh, I want to say uh, thank you again to all the kids, uh, 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 grandkids, great grandkids for really chosen us here. Right. So anyway, that's it. And <laughs> a long introduction, but uh, just want to take care of all of that. And we're going to talk a little bit about compost. Uh, compost is the simplest thing in the world. It's really like a, a, a pseudo bread. You need four ingredients, basically. Uh, um, it's, there's nothing simpler than that. Uh, but it's like sourdough bread or like bread that takes a kind of a, a, a patience and attention and, and care uh, for, for that to work. So anyway, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and how I got into uh, compost. Uh, and then the, I'll show you what I do at the uh, Ojibwe school. Um, I, uh, uh, I was born 67 years ago on a small farm in uh, southwest France on the Atlantic coast. Um, my family, they were uh, farmers, but they were not owner, owners of the land. So that means that, that as I grew up, you know, I wouldn't have a place where to uh, sink some roots, you know, we had to move on. Um, <clears throat> um, so, uh, and in that place where I grew up in France, it was just like a paradise for a kid. Uh, it was in a very old farm that was uh, uh, hundreds of years old, uh, uh, a settlement that maybe even thousands of years uh, 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 there, right? Back to the Roman time, who knows? Uh, and it was uh, uh, surrounded by the uh, woods. So you had the farm, the farm body, and then the woods, and then the fields all the way outside. So I was a, a little like that, you know, I spent all my time, my, my mom had uh, five kids, you know, so, uh, and I was the first one. So I had all the time in my life just to be outside when my mom was busy with the little ones, you know, we came one after the other like that. But then one day we moved. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, I, uh, you know, that's from my childhood, I ended up uh, uh, in Manhattan, New York, right, of all places, uh, uh, back in 1983. Um, uh, 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 and I was missing that, uh, those woods, you know, the, that that outdoor those farms you know you know what the big cities you know big buildings and everything that I I, uh, 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 I started uh, collecting all the plants that I could find in, uh, in Manhattan right? I would go to work down in downtown Manhattan and coming back and over there uh, people you know and plants get some disease or start losing leaves and let people throw it in the street but actually they even whole buildings, uh, offices, you know, they put a dumpster and they change all the plants, you know, they're not dead yet, but uh, put some fresh plants, new plants in there. So uh, I was like people that collect cats like that, they just collect <laughs> plants and then filled up my apartment. Uh, and the thing about New York is that I really felt trapped, you know, stuck in this place. And it took me a long time, it took me 10 years to, uh, 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 kind of disentangle myself from the, the skyscrapers, right, scrapers. Uh, and I ended up in, uh, uh, um, in Minneapolis. Um, and in Minneapolis, I, uh, then I, I, you know, I gave in my love of plants even more. And I was very lucky. I was able at some point uh, to get a job as a baker during the winter and then do landscaping during the summer. Right? Um, now, I'm telling you all of that uh, uh, because, you know, whether it's uh, New York or uh, uh, Minneapolis, um, the, 
thing that I face immediately is, is uh, uh, there is no soil. You go to the city, there's no, there's no earth. I mean, there, there is dirt, all right? But it's, it's been budos built over and, and it's like, and so all the soil, when you live in the city, uh, all the soil that if you want to plant a garden, you have to, you know, uh, uh, if you use a vacant, vacant lot, you know, you might have to do a lot of cleanup too, but you have to bring, you have to make soil. And um, so that's kind of the story of my life. You know, I had, uh, and, and I'm going to quote uh, uh, one of my mentors uh, here. Uh, his name is Will Allen from uh, Milwaukee, from Growing Power. Uh, he's, I imagine, retired now. Uh, but uh, he said that he was uh, the, the grandfather of urban farming. Uh, he grew stuff in Milwaukee, downtown, you know, in the Gale Woods and like that. And he said, my business is to grow soil before I grow vegetables. So meaning that you can't grow vegetables if you don't have the soil anyway. And it's what he had to do, right? So anyway, um, uh, after you know, many years moving the dirt around uh, Minneapolis, I ended up uh, uh, here in uh, Guaba Igani, it's uh, soil, uh, right across from the lake right here. Uh, um, I, uh, I had a teepee right then and set it up right across from uh, Jim Northrop that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier on the Northrop Road. Right? Um, and, and then there again, you know, I, I can't help myself. It's almost like a compulsion. <laughs> I need a little bit of dirt and I plant stuff, right? So I tried to put a garden at the uh, elders in, uh, in Sawyer. Right? And that, that was funny because I didn't consult with anybody or me planning uh, on the reservation. And there was a, 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 an old fencing for garden there. And I said, hey, this is perfect. I just go and start digging and again, bringing dirt and compost and plant stuff. Then the following year, the uh, uh, public works had planned, you know, I'm sure they do those you know, 10 year planning and something like that to put a, a septic tank <laughs> from the elders and they put that smack where the garden was, you know. So uh, kind of funny uh, like that. Um, anyway, so yeah, I came here and then at uh, first I became a uh, Jim Northrop uh, personal French chef. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, a little while later, I went back to college here and uh, ended up uh, living and working in uh, uh, Duluth, where again, I baked, but uh, again, I found some uh, landscaping. I became an urban farmer for the Duluth Grill, which is kind of a local uh, 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 busy restaurant that some of you might know. Right. And uh, we actually went to Growing Power and met Will Allen and get really inspired by that. And uh, basically, I was able to, uh, uh, they let me, they paid me, amazingly, to dig up the parking lot, <laughs> we dig up the asphalt and everything, and then put a big uh, uh, kugel bed, you know, like a mound, and then planted uh, sort of that an orchard uh, uh, downtown. Right. And at uh, the same time, and now we get in the two uh, 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 Bama Bidi right? That's in 2008. Um, so uh, I was working in Duluth, you know, growing stuff on the parking lot, on the roof and stuff like that. And then uh, um, uh, 2008, uh, uh, you can see the picture uh, over there on the left. There is a lady right on the extreme left there with a white shirt. That's a uh, Dr. Jocelyn Dorsher from, uh, she was uh, the, um, what you said, the head of uh, Kane Center for American Indian and Minority Health at UMD. And uh, she, uh, uh, raised money uh, to bring young people uh, into health uh, careers, 
right, to uh, study uh, medicine, things like that at UMD. But in, in her uh, um, uh, idea is that uh, we had to uh, uh, get children as young as possible into health and health, uh, 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 interested about health in general. And she thought that the way to do that was to do with gardening and cooking. And uh, she knew what I was doing at the Dewey's Grill in the garden back then. So she asked me if I would uh, uh, take uh, uh, the garden job to, uh, to do that with the kids during the summer, right? In summer school. And uh, again, it was a very interesting, and it's, uh, again, it's, it has to do with compost as well, telling you a lot about myself, but um, uh, there was no real place. So you, you have to think, and you all know uh, 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 the RBC, right? The, the building, natural resources, the school, uh, uh, and the RBC. Right, and it's a it's a it's a city. It's part of Skokie, actually. Right, it's part of the city of Skokie, and it's actually a city. You know, it's really open. There's a lot of trees and stuff like that, but that's part of the cities. And actually, all the the terrain over there, where there it's the sidewalks or the back of the school area, thing there, something that has been, you know, uh, turned over, bulldozed, and filled, and everything. You name it. Right? There's no original soil whatsoever back there. And also no real place. There's a power ground, there's a, you know, the wine house, and then so where do we put the garden, right? And then uh, and then I have learned my lesson in, in Sawyer, right? <laughs> there's a find the right place, you know, so next year they don't ask you to move again and dig everything and all of that. Uh, and they had, uh, you can see in the picture, they had an ice rink uh, uh, there that had never been used. Uh, and there was nothing used, you know, there was no uh, uh, hockey coach or anything like that, never, never been used. And uh, after looking at everything, you know, because you have to think here, like in the winter, where do they push, you know, big parking lot, where do you push the snow? You don't want to put a garden there either. You know, you don't want to be in the way in the winter. You have to find the right place. So, oops. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So anyway, the, the ice rink was perfect. Now, again, I'm in a situation where there's not, you can see it's just gravel, real gravel and rocks that they use as a field from a gravel pit somewhere to have some really flat, hard surface to be able to ice it up in the winter. So not even a, a shred of dirt or anything like that. So that's why we, the first thing we did is build race beds, you know, and boom, went to get compost down um, in uh, 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 Duluth at WLSSD, you know, they sell compost, it's cheap. Compost is cheap, 30 bucks for a pickup load, right? It's five yard or something like that. Well, maybe two or three yard, I don't know. No, it's one yard. Uh, I shouldn't tell you, that's a long time since I've got uh, compost, but it's 30 dollars for a pickup load, all right? So it's, it's cheap, you know, pickup load, you, you could fill maybe two of those uh, raised beds. Now, again, I'm telling you all of that, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little more uh, 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 about what we, where we are today. It's, there's no way that we uh, will achieve food sovereignty that will be sustainable and feed ourselves here. There's no way that we're going to do that without composting everything. 
And I mean everything. If we, we should lose, you know, all this uh, material uh, uh, and throw it in the garbage, you know, and waste it like this. Uh, uh, and, and for many reasons, uh, uh, not only because, uh, you know, there are places like that where there is no soil, we need soil, uh, but um, uh, there's a book here that I brought and uh, I just read that this week I and mean, I, I was here like every day, you know, break at work and everything. Uh, 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 talks about uh, uh, phosphorus. We familiar with phosphorus, NPK, right? Phosphorus is one of the three essential micro elements uh, 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 for plants, uh, nutrition. Uh, and phosphorus, it's an incredible story. I mean, the stuff that uh, has to do with alchemy and, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 it's really amazing. Um, but, but phosphorus is, is very finite. It's actually phosphorus, and I learned that in this book, doesn't exist uh, uh, in a pure state. Right. We have rocks, and then it's funny. I mean, that's uh, that's where it's really uh, fascinating history. But so England, uh, in the late 1700s, when they were starting exploring and going all over the world, right? They had so many people already there, you know, where they they were starting kind of the industrial revolution and all of that, that they couldn't fit them. Their soil, they have been cultivating there since a Roman time, since the Celtic time, you know, 2000 years. And uh, uh, their population by then had really, really uh, uh, increased. And they were using manure and stuff like that, but they, they, couldn't, keep, they couldn't keep up. And they were facing a, a, a starvation, actually. And then suddenly there are people in Germany and then uh, 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 in particular, that discovered the phosphorus, a guy named Libby, right, that discovered those NPK, those elements. And then in the same time, traveling all around the world, they found islands off Peru that were mounds, mountains, literally mountains, full of bird guano, you know, bird shit, basically, that had petrified and they had, they imported people all the way from China, I'd say thousands of people to work and they, that stuff is super poison too. And amazingly, in something like 20 or 30 years, they erased those islands, they imported everything, not only in England, but all over Europe and everywhere, even in the United States. And that's how they fed everybody is with that stuff, that's for sports. Um, <laughs> right. um, and then uh, they run out of it, you know, when they say, oh, again, they're going to starve. And then they found the little way that actually they, the, the, the story, you got to read this book. They found out on the, you know, those cliffs around England, they have those white dauber cliffs, huh? Right? They, uh, there was a lady actually, and she was a pioneer in paleontology, you know, bones and stuff like that. And she made a bit. And of course, you know, in the early 1800s, the late 1700s, nobody even acknowledged her, right? Uh, and she made a living just like she was actually a real scientist by like, like selling pieces, bones, or shells, like that. But some of those guys that had discovered the phosphorus and all of that, by chance, look at uh, and some of those fossils that she was there, and they saw those clumps. When you break it, there is all kind of little bones and everything in there, and there's where coprolites. Coprolites is a uh, it's a it's a fossilized shit, right? <laughs> or crap. And that's what it is, you know. Uh, uh, but this is full of phosphorus. And they are, so they started digging all that stuff again, you know, and during the 1800s. And then for two, 30 or 40 years, they, uh, that's it, they keep growing stuff, you know, feeding everybody. Uh, and they ran out of it again. But then they found that there is a, so uh, um, 
that phosphorus, there is a one, uh, the, the, the main source is in Morocco. And it's a big political thing because it's in uh, uh, the um, uh, um, Sahara, we, the uh, uh, that Western Sahara that was you know, occupied by the, uh, colonized by the Spaniards. And then Morocco took over when the Spaniards, in the 70s, when the Spaniards left, right? Canary Islands? Huh? Canary Islands, right? No, that's uh, in the Sahara Desert, the south of Morocco. So the islands are there, on the coast out there, but that uh, phosphorus is right smack in the dunes. It's in the middle of the desert. And that's all there is over there, except for some fishing on the coast. And, but I mentioned all of that, and it's really important for our conversation here, is that 75% of all the phosphorus that's known today, and it's limited, it's more limited. There's more problem with peak phosphorus and there's with peak oil. You know, they talk about peak oil, we're gonna run out of oil at some point. Well, we get a couple of hundred years, something like that. Phosphorus, there are people that are saying 30 years Right? That's what we have. And, and they feed 75% of all the world. It goes everywhere, from Russia to everywhere, phosphorus. Um, in the United States, we have one gigantic mine, again, old bones and stuff like that, white stuff, uh, in Florida. But then the Florida, this is going to even end up, it's already running out right now. Okay. So the problem with phosphorus is not a, a just that uh, 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 um, you know they might be they might find some more things like that. It's just at some point there's only one country that's going to have the monopole of all that stuff. You can't go without phosphorus. You can't go nothing. So very something again very interesting that I learned in that book about NPK. There is a law of the minimum. And I didn't know about that. I heard Gardner forever, but I never heard of that. The law of the minimum, those guys have found the NPKC says, so the only way that the, uh, the element, one of those three elements, you know, the phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium, right? It's the lowest one that dictate how much the plants can take. Right? And the way to imagine that, that there is an image that's really good. You take a barrel, all right, like a, a, wooden, a wooden cask, right? And then you cut, you know, they made of slabs, right? Um, slats, right? You cut one low, one above, and then to the top. If you pour water in there, right, or you pour a, a Potash, right? It's never going to go higher than the lowest cut. Right? It's going to pour out. So you can uh, uh, add tons of nitrogen if your potash is the 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 the, 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 the lowest thing. You can put all the nitrogen you want, nitrogen you want, all the potassium you want. Your plant is not going to take it. It's that's the law of the minimum. That's that's how it works. Mm -hmm. So anyway, again, you know, all of that, uh, 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 I'm saying, another very interesting thing is about potash. Uh, 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 yeah, phosphorus, I'm sorry. Um, is that today, so in the uh, uh, 50s, uh, you know, they, uh, the, uh, after World War II, we have a washing machine, you know, wash out clothes and everything like that. And they figured out that uh, uh, by adding some phosphorus into the soap, uh, uh, it washed better. Actually, sometimes it washed better, sometimes it didn't wash better. But everybody said the thing was uh, the, the, uh, uh, when you put phosphorus with your soap, it's going to make a huge amount. I think, crazy amount of suds. And of course, you know, uh, Tides was uh, the big company that uh, made the millions for that. 
they, they call it Sadzar Us, right? But in a, in a matter of years, rivers had, some rivers actually had like icebergs of sud going down the river on the lakes everywhere and the water everywhere. And uh, uh, they freaked out. I said, we got to stop that. So they, uh, today, there's very low phosphorus, you know, in your uh, washing machine. But today, we have more phosphorus going into our waters. And even here in Lake Superior, right? Lake Superior, for the first time, because of climate change, had green algae. And actually, it's a blue-green algae, which is a, not an algae, but a cyano, it's a, a, a chlorophyllic a cyanobacteria. It's a bacteria, right? That looks like an algae. And that stuff is poison. It'll kill you. You fall in it, it's a mix of green goop. So Lake Erie has those big dead zones every year now. And all of that comes from farming. Those big, around Lake Erie, they have those big cathodes, uh, concentrated, you remember the word? Uh, uh, um, animal farming operation. Animal farming operation. 10,000 cows. In one spot, the same thing with pigs and, and, and turkeys and chickens, right? And all that stuff. And there's a, so you, you imagine the, the amount of, of, of feces and, and, and urine that comes out of there every single day. And they have to have those giant lagoons, right? Uh, uh, to fill that stuff. But they can't keep that in there too, the smell and everything like that. And they, it keeps coming. So you have to empty those lagoons. So, the federal government allowed them, allowed the farmers to spread that on fields. But of course, you know, in all the all around Lake Erie, oh, here too. Uh, uh, no, because we have that problem with Lake Superior. Um, and, and it's killing everything, you know? And actually, you can kill a person if you fall in that goop uh, uh, and thing like that. It's like there is some poison that poison your liver. So anyway, on one hand, we're going to run out of the, the, the artificial phosphorus. On the other hand, we have too much that's killing everything. Now, there is a solution to that. And then again, it's composted. Right? And uh, so anyway. Uh, just real quick to uh, you know, 20 minutes. Left. OK. All right. We're going to just go through that. So again, I, I told you composting, everybody can do it. You just need a little. Uh, corner of uh, soil, all right? I guess you could do that even in your basement or if you do worms, you know, in the tot, all right? Uh, it's a little more involved, but if you have a, a, uh, um, a house, you know, in the backyard, and even, even really small, very little, you don't really need a bitch, you can compost, all right? And uh, this bring me to uh, um, uh, another topic uh, with uh, uh, compost. And um, I have a book here, it's, it's called Braiding. I don't know if anyone seen it, Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, Robin Ball Kimmer, she's a Potawatomi woman uh, in Michigan, and she's a, uh, 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 you know, Dr. Kimmer, she's a doctor in uh, biology or botany or something like that, right? uh, but she's also a traditional uh, 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 Potawatomi lady, and then she brings together that, that, that uh, knowledge you know, traditional ecological knowledge and modern science together. And um, uh, that, that's how I, uh, uh, I, I come to understand what I do, you know, with composting and things like that. It's, um, and that's why, I, you know, I introduced myself to language. Language is teaching me a lot. I wish I, I spoke more, um, but 
when we don't compost, when we, uh, you know, I, I'm here, I've got clean deer here, right? Uh, hunting, clean some deer. And then uh, we, uh, you know, we, we didn't have actually a place or compost to take care of that. So it went in the garbage, mm. right? But that's, a, and that we do that, that's happened every day, you know, that's, a, we don't have really options for that. But from what I've learned here, all the 20 years that I've been around here is that that's not how we treat those relatives. Because that's what, and that's why I mentioned Robin Val Kinner. She says that uh, 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 all those plants, when I say, when I introduce myself, I say, uh, I say, hey, hello, all my relatives. Now that means it was just not you guys and you know, my family and friends and all of that. But that, that means everything from almost like bacteria to a tree to a whale. So everything, those are all our relatives. You know, that's the way I understand it. And uh, uh, one of the teaching that I have, I work at the school here, at the Ojibwe school. I am a, a gardener, a master gardener, a garden master. Um, and and uh, we, everybody, uh, even if you're not Ojibwe, you, you have to include in your teachings the, uh, the seven uh, uh, teachings, wisdom, right? And, uh, and uh, one of them is respect. So, and that's that's how I see it. So that's why at the at the school, everything that we eat, we don't put anything in the garbage. We try to compost it. So we say we close the loop. That's the idea about composting. You see, it's really uh, 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 reestablishing that uh, uh, relationship, that reconnecting, you know, with nature. Composting. That's that's how I see it. I understand it. Uh, um, it, it's interesting again that uh, that book here. Um, she proposed. She says that, uh, and this book is made for young people. She has one that's made for really adults, you know, and this one is made for young young adults. But she says that uh, in English, and that's that's really important. Again, the change it, it takes a real effort to to change, and that's why I say composting is a is a. Uh, is uh, 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 the word will come back, but what she says is that in English, um, everything that's not human is it, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't, um, in, in an Ojibwe, the way I understand it, again, you know, I don't. I'm not really far from being a uh, fluent, uh, but I've been told that, you know, things are either animate or inanimate. And I understand that in French, we, we, we have gender for everything. You know, even a rock has gender. It's feminine. Oh, it's French, you know. <laughs> it's, figure that, uh, that went out, right? But again, animate, animate. And in English, it's eat. So even if it's a you know a frog or something like that, it's eat. It's a thing. It's something. It's not an animal. It's not a, a relative, a relation. And she proposed that uh, we try to make an effort to to replace it when we talk about something animate, like this, with ki. K I. You know, like a different gender, just for. You know, plants, trees, rocks, water, key. And, and that's very interesting. I've got, it's kind of a little exercise that we refrain from trying to do that in a presentation like that because that becomes a little confusing. But um, anyway, and the last thing I'm going to add about this is that uh, I'm sure everybody has heard about the. Uh, 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 sin fires and ace fires, right? So today I've been told that we are in the seven fire and I've been told that re repeatedly, you know? And then we are at the fork. We're, we're standing there, that seven fire, and we're looking at the road branching like a Y, right? 
Now, on one side, uh, uh, we're going to keep uh, uh, toward the sixth extension where all the insects are disappearing, the climate change, and all of that stuff, right? Polluting the waters with uh, phosphorus and all of that. Or we're going to take a role, we're going to decide to really change our habits and everything. And we're going to come together. That's what I, I hear. Where all the races come together, you know, we stop fighting and, and, and we work toward fixing the, the, the earth or the S fire. And that's the only reason, the only way the S fire is going to happen. Now, the way I see it is actually, it's not just all the races and all the people coming back together. It's also all we, we got to bring back all our relatives. Again, you know, the plants, the trees, uh, the birds, uh, the whales, everybody has to be, you know, like a Noah's Ark. They have to be, they have to come in in that ice fires with us. We can't keep losing them. Uh, um, and again, compost is the solution that I see there. Right, to bring back diversity. Right? And I'm going to go through the this, this slide very quickly. If I can uh, restart that. All right. And uh, I'm going to show you what I do at the school. So uh, that was in 2008, right? Uh, 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 there. And OK. So when I make a compost, compost I, I told, I, I said earlier, you know, it's like uh, uh, making sourdough bread. Uh, you need a sourdough bread, you need flour, water, salt, and yeast. And then, <laughs> yeah. Compost is the same thing. You need carbon, nitrogen, uh, 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 and microbes, and then water. That's all you need. Uh, did I say, yeah, nitrogen. So, if you, if you mix that, like making a bread, if you mix that just the, the right way, it's going to work by itself, right? And the key to be safe is to have more carbon than nitrogen. Always, you know, have carbon in excess. And here, we're very lucky. We live in a country, this is woodland, right? So we can get wood chips as much as we want. Right? Or sawdust, or uh, well, at the school I use straw, right? And it's not ideal, but uh, it's kind of the easiest for me. And then I've got wood chips. I mean, wood chips are really uh, you can get a full truck of wood chips from uh, Rick's Tree Service in Duluth for um, I see it's twelve yards for uh, forty bucks or fifty bucks. I mean, some it's it's ridiculous. You know, they come, they dump it. That's a big pile. You know, and they, they don't do half or a third, or you got to take those 12 yards. All right. So, if you have a small backyard, that might be a little problematic there. But you can go uh, uh, collect, uh, I guess, straw, uh, dead leaves in Duluth. I've been, I've been uh, all those years where I had a composting in, uh, been composting in Duluth. I would, uh, every spring, they, they got me the last couple of years, they, uh, they hate that, the rose garden. They uh, cover those uh, rose bushes with big bags of leaves every year, and then they pull them off. And uh, not just me, but all the people would come and, and grab those, you know, to use for compost or whatever mulching you want to do. And now they basically uh, almost taking them out at night and then <laughs> cart them out, you know, instantly taking them to WSSD and and I don't know, you know, it's a city or you know, safety or whatever, you know, for whatever reason, but kind of lost my source of uh, carbon. But anyway, carbon we, we can get uh, tons of it here. So I start a couple with tile. I just put a lot of uh, straw on the bottom. And at the school, you will see a little further. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I compost like every day I get uh, 20, so it depends on the day, 20 to 30 gallons a day of slop. You know, things that the kids scrape up their tray, their food trays, and then stuff that comes up the kitchen and all of that. 
So in order to accommodate that, and I think they've done something you might be able to look at here, it's right behind the, here, right? Where they do it for the fish. Mm -hmm. So they did the same thing that I did at the school. So I bought, it's not cheap, it's $8 bail, all right? So it's kind of a little bit of an investment, but the school, the scale we do it, uh, it's ideal. And I use bales, you know, those square rectangular straw bales, and I build a, a container, a wall, right? with a floor of straw bales. And the reason for that, especially the food from the school, is really wet. And you don't want the thing you don't want to compost is that when it starts rotting, you don't want to have you know juice all over the place and uh, right because uh, you need water, but you don't want that you know if there's a big rain. So um, having this thick of straw on the solid. Uh, it just, I've never had anything leaking out of there. Okay. So that's the way I do it. But this is a, this is a small uh, compost. It's a tree bean uh, uh, system. We'll see. Anyway, made with uh, um, uh, um, uh, pallets covered with uh, um, hardware cloth, right? Because the, the, the pallets, you see the hardware, uh, the hardware class here is maybe not very clear, but the, the thing, there's two things with that, is that if you don't put it that a hardware class on the pallets, all that stuff is gonna go, a lot of it is gonna go and uh, you know, turn into dirt, but inside the pallets, and then you're gonna have uh, weeds growing in there and all of that, and your pallets are gonna rot very quickly, all right? And they're gonna last you three years, and then you're gonna have to replace them, all right? So hardware cloth. The other reason for the hardware cloth. So there's, you know, things that uh, pro and cons with compost, of course. If you are in, in the city of Duluth and possibly in Cloquet, I've not had the problem at the school yet, but uh, in the city of Duluth, you build a compost in your backyard, you get rats. And right, so I'm not, I got I to tell you, I love, uh, I live in Duluth. I live right off Mesaba, in third and fourth, right in, you know, downtown there. I have a big backyard, very steep. Uh, and I have deer, skunks, uh, 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 raccoons, squirrels, you name it. But rats, I can put the, <laughs> you know, I'll deal with everything but rats. Right? Rats are really, uh, and they get sick, they get in your house. I mean, it's a, it's real problem. Yeah. So there are ways to deal with that. And one of the ways is to build a compost bin that's rat proof. That's what I'm doing at, at home right now uh, with hardware cloth. They, they can get into a quarter size, but. How can you make something rat proof on a rack to do a, a, a pipe? Yeah, well, it, it's metal. That's the uh, only thing that uh, there is a, uh, if you're interested in, uh, uh, you know, we have problems with rats and uh, you don't want to know how to deal it, there's a Facebook page that's uh, 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 fantastic. It's for Fernandale Rats Patrol. And it's a, it's a town in Fernandale. I'm not sure where it is. It's in Pennsylvania or something like that. And they have huge uh, tons of problems with rats. Rats are extremely smart, very hard to catch, but there are ways and techniques uh, to catch them and not hurt uh, birds or squirrels in the, in the process and all of that. So there is a way to, to really taking care of that without using poison, of course, or uh, glue traps or whatever. And one of them or two is to rat proof. Uh, my, uh, so uh, my pallets are closed on the, the, the bottom are, are bricks where the juice can still come out, right, uh, and gravel, but they, the rats can go. It's a, it's a big bricks, layer of bricks. They can go through that. And then the hardware cloth is totally closed, and then there is a, a kind of a covered hardware cloth on the on top. And they can't shoot through hardware cloths. You know, they can shoot through pipes, through electrical wires and stuff like that, but the hardware cloth is something that uh, uh, you can get. Now, the thing too is that compost, 
And the rats don't really go, if it's a, a very active fire, rats don't go in there for food. You know, they're going to come in your house and eat through your granola or whatever, you know, your cereals. But they use that if they have access to it as a, uh, it's like rat city, right? It's warm, it's hot, uh, 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 and, and, you know, build tunnels and all of that in there. Uh, but if you, if you compost is built right, uh, built right, you know, uh, the temperature I get in my compost is uh, um, from 140 to 180. That's the temperature. And I brought here, you know, if you are interested in doing compost, you need uh, one of those. Uh, you can do without it if you want, but it's really nice to see how your compost is going anyway. Um, so anyway, you build your carbon and you need to, to really, your, like the microbes, right? Eat that uh, nitrogen, right? Uh, uh, and they use oxygen for that and carbon. Right? So you need to have enough carbon for that pile to get really active, get hot. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't, if it goes anaerobic, that's it, you know, like if you don't have enough air in there and stuff like that, it starts really smelling like rotten eggs. Right? And it's, it putrefies, it doesn't really compost or decompose. Right? Um, so the, the recipe for compost is that, as I said, a lot of carbon and you can add a lot of nitrogen like this. That's a uh, last year uh, uh, fish, uh, what people uh, from uh, sparing and knitting here, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Murray. Uh, uh, oh no, that's from Nikki Crew. <laughs> yeah, that stuff was really right when he got there. I don't know which. <laughs> They went fishing uh, with the kids somewhere, uh, some camp. And then they came back and the, the bags, you know, they were in plastic, heavy duty plastic bag. And they must have sat in someone's front for a day or two, you know, but it's really 80 degrees. And when I got it, I, I didn't get time to, to take care of it right away. So when I opened that stuff, man, there was a, now, if you have that, if you spread it on carbon and then you cover it with enough carbon, it, it's gonna smell just the time you cover it and that's it. And it's gonna cook so fast, so hot, you know, in two days that it's all, it's all gone. Um, now again, very important is the aeration index. So you need your carbon, you know, uh, they leave soda, soda is really nice because it, it uh, compacts, right? Uh, at the same time, you want, you want still want that oxygen in there. So when you layer stuff, you do like lasagna, you know, you pile up. That's why I like straw too. Straw leave a lot of space. Now, when you get a small pile like that, it's fairly easy to maintain four by four by four, right? Like a, a cubic thing. Now, at the school right now, it's like what they, uh, they're going to have here is, uh, I can't remember how many straw bales on the floor, but it's uh, 15 feet by 15 feet, right? and this high right now. So this, we just wait, and there's so much moisture in there that it, it's really easy to go anaerobic, right? The compression and all of that, there's no oxygen that comes in there. So what I have to do right now is, and I hate doing this, but there's no real alternative. I have to sink. Uh, that it, it reached, uh, so I started the pile in uh, um, like October, November, right? Uh, right before the winter. And then I had a leave of absence for three months, so we didn't pile it. So it's not, it's, it's about that high now, but it's just at the height where I gotta create uh, aeration in there. And the way I'm doing this is that I've uh, saved, uh, um, I'll make something more appealing here. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, 
uh, I have a salvage PVC pipes. A PVC is one of uh, those nightmare things, right? Uh, uh, um, Let's, uh, oh. Sorry, folks, our Zoom screen decided to shut down. Um, so, so they should be able to hear you. And okay. You from here. And then uh, we want to have the, the thing here. Um, they, they can see it, they online, can see it but, online, but not here. Yeah. Okay, well, I wanted to show you. So um, uh, they can see online, I have a picture of uh, the food that we I get from the cafeteria, from the school. And then... Uh, oh, it's just sharing from here? It's not, this is how do you... Uh, okay. it's, it's not moving either here. Oh, you see that's green? Oh, yeah. Okay. So okay. This okay. Just... Okay. Yeah. So uh, you can see it, but anyway, I have the same pile with the fish covered with uh, a rice husk. That's another really deep surface problem. Uh, I know here on the farm you like to use it uh, in the garden as a mulch, right? But uh, again, you know, uh, wild rice husk uh, is really good. Uh, you can see uh, my. Um, Thermometer in there. So, oh, yeah, I guess uh, I don't know if you can see. You need water. That's, that, that's really important. The moisture, you, nothing is going to happen with some of that food that you get for your, uh, your kitchen, right? At home, I use, actually, I don't use that so from the ENP. Uh, I collect stuff from anybody, anybody carbon on the uh, compost. Uh, Crazy, I remember, but that's from the ENP, but that's a good size. And I get uh, at home, uh, I, uh, I have two kids, uh, grandchildren that I raise. Um, once in a while, uh, I, I get ice cream, you know. So you know those uh, one gallon ice cream buckets? They're perfect. You know, I could get that under the sink and that thing, I got four of them. Uh, Anyway, and I think that's another uh, nice option, you know, with a lid, you know, something with a lid, uh, collect your compost at home. Now, the, the thing I should mention about this is that a good 40% of all the food that's raised, whether it's animal or vegetable and plants, goes to waste. And it goes to landfill. In landfill, it produced methane forever uh, that they try to trap, right? With, uh, they, they, they put the poly stuff and hills and stuff like that, or they burn it, you know? Again, when all that stuff, uh, we should capture the carbon. That's another thing you do when you, you compost, you do carbon capture. You're putting that back into the soil, that carbon that's uh, uh, creating climate change. Uh, but a good, 38% of all the food that's cultivated processes and like that, and it get wasted. That's almost half, it's crazy. And the majority of it is actually in the kitchen. 
it's not on the farm. It's not in the processing on the way. It's in our kitchen. And I tell you, I with two kids, and I like to, we like cooking at home. But you know, the, uh, uh, my wife and I, you know, I shouldn't put all the blame on her. We like we always cook more than for uh, four of us, right? There's always some leftovers. The kids never eat the leftovers pretty much. You know, I'm the only one eating it. And then you always have stuff, you know, like a head of lettuce or whatever that goes, you know, ugly in uh, uh, in the refrigerator. Always there is always a you know half a salsa of uh, spaghetti salsa uh, jar, well, whatever. I guarantee you that I can take a minimum of uh, because we cook every day, every night. That's a, my wife and I kind of principle for, for our kids. They eat junk food at school and everywhere. So we try to, you know, feed them good at home. But, and we're big coffee drinkers. That's like another really good stuff for a good nitrogen for your compost. I have at least two to three of those gallons every single week and sometimes more. Every single week coming out of that kitchen going, and we, we're re religious about saving everything, you know, even an old cookie, whatever it goes in the compost. And, and you can compost everything. You see the fish. I have, uh, in that compost, I have put uh, um, raccoons that I picked off the road or whatever, you know. Uh, so that's another thing about the compost here. And so, uh, this is the temperature, if you know, you see, that's when I just built it. It's at 60 degrees, right? It's 44 outside, and uh, what's, the, uh, what's the date? It's pretty cold anyway. Uh, but that's uh, two days later. Uh, it's at 100 and, uh, oh, moving the pictures, sorry. Um, anyway, it's at 100 and, uh, what is that, 120 degrees. Two days later, you know, that's how fast. So I don't know if you can see it, but um, I'm sure online they can see it. This is my tree bean system. So I'm going to, how much time do I have? 640. This time. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, two hours. Right. Oh, my God. oh, okay. All right. There, there's a, a just Two things that I want to, to add, uh, um, uh, because I, I could talk about this stuff for, forever, right? Uh, um, but I mean, you can tell, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the system you see here is the tree bean system. And that's a system, this is the safest, right? Because what, what you don't want is you, you don't want to have a, a E. coli or salmonella or stuff like that, that, that go back into your garden, you know, and then uh, next time you make a lettuce, you know, the kids get sick or something, right? If you sell at the market, you don't want that to happen. So there, there are, uh, and there are very good web, websites, Rodale Institute. Remember that name, Rodale Institute. If you ever want to uh, go compost, go there. They have the best. It's so organic. It's a. It's a. They've been like uh, in business for forty years. I'm not sure where it is. Again, Pennsylvania or Tennessee or something like that. But they have been studying organic agriculture, and they. It's a. It's a nonprofit that do studies. Anyway, so go to Rodale, and uh, I will uh, give the, the links and all of that. Right. Um, but uh, to, to make sure you have no seeds and no microbe in there, you need, uh, I don't know, two, three weeks. And they, they tell you that on those websites, how long do you have to have it at, you know, above 130 degrees. Right? Now, that's good. And that's what they do. That's what they, uh, the recommendation is from the USDA, from the state, from everybody, right? Um, but I, I do it differently. For the the uh, the reason that uh, first of all, you know, if you are at home, you can't always get that pile just so hot. You know, there's not enough stuff coming out of your kitchen to to get that really really cooking. You know, uh, uh, fast. But 
if you build a pile, and I have built in the past, I didn't have those tree beans here. I just made a pile on the ground. Some straw, some leaves, some fresh stuff, more leaves and straw, fresh stuff, and just, just piled it. If you leave that pile three years, I guarantee you, you don't need to turn it. It doesn't need to be uh, hot. In three years, it's going to be dirt. Uh, and then everything is going to be the microbes and all of that. It's going to be dirt, thing. Right? So it's just a matter of giving time. People want this 135 degrees for two weeks because they want that compost right away. They want to sell it or whatever. Right? My system is a tree bean system. My pile, I do. I build a pile for one entire year. When it's built, I'll let it cook. For another entire year. That's why there's three beans. I don't know if you guys can see that. All right. But one of the beans, the one on the left here, all right, I filled that for a whole year. When it's full, I empty the other one there that's ready, that's two years old, and I restart it. I start a new one. Do you, you understand? Oops. All right. So, and then in the middle with a roof here, sorry about the ground here, that's where I keep my carbon. The straw, or the leaves, the down in bags and things like that. Right? And then I have those uh, uh, rainwater uh, barrels to, uh, to collect the water. Right? So if I, uh, I, you know, there's dry, I use just rainwater. Uh, so my pile by going for two years, give me a total guarantee that the whole thing is decomposed. Now, there is something, and this is where it's new, and I really hope that uh, I would like to see here uh, uh, and at the college and uh, myself at the school is that there is a real value and value added in the compost if we bring it to the next level. Right, not just compost, but the compost that they sell you at WSSD, that stuff is really, it's that, it doesn't look like dirt. Dirt, you know, it's really greasy and really good black dirt, you know, if you clump it, it stays together, thing like that. That stuff that they sell at WSSD, there's a whole bunch of little pieces of wood and it's all powdery. Right? They, it's pure carbon. And there's, of course, there's some nitrogen and stuff like that. But they just cook it for uh, two months. All right, months and two months, and then they, they sell it to you. And that stuff is hot. I mean, you, you grab it there, there, it smokes and smells, it's hot and everything like that. But that stuff has no, the life has, has been cooked out of it. So it's safe. You could eat it, you know, I wouldn't want to do that, right? But it's safe, but it's dead. And what I want is a compost, and that's the reason with the two years. We have, the, the second years, you have a mesophilic uh, uh, composting, cold composting. The first year get hot, then pile it. Then you let it sit for an entire year, it goes cold. But when it goes cold, you have all kinds of things that move in there, like kill bugs, like worms, uh, uh, like uh, uh, fungi. And actually, I do add fungi. And that's the last thing I want to get in, into uh, uh, no. Is what we want to bring. What we, our soils are dead, right uh, here because there's there was no soil to begin with, right? This is woodland. Their glaciers were here six thousand years ago, and they wet all the soil. There's no soil here, uh, and it's gone because uh, you know they logged everything, and uh, we had the big giant fires in 1918 that burned the rest of the soil out. <laughs> Uh, leftover, right? there's no soil here. But, so we, we have to bring soil, but we can't bring, it's the same way we can't bring uh, 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 um, chemical fertilizers or, you know, artificial fertilizers. We can't bring just compost that's, that's dead matter. We have to figure out actually how to bring back the life of the soil in there. And the soil, I just read some of that, that was yesterday, amazing article. They discover anybody right now that uh, we know something like 180,000 uh, fungus, you know, mushrooms, you know, uh, uh, 
there are millions and maybe even billions of them that you never see. They never make a mushroom or thing like that. They live in the soil. Now they can discover that by analyzing the DNA. They take a spoon of soil, they check all the DNA around there and say, oh, look at that. They say it's like the black, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the dark energy. And, uh, you know, the universe, is, uh, the real, the, the visible universe is just like 10%. And then most of the years is, is a dark, dark energy. Same thing with fungi. Now, all those fungi, especially obscure fungus, live on the roots and they feed, they, they mediate, they protect the plant. It's like your microbiome in your guts and things like that. Those fungi live with the plants. And the plants that we have in the garden are forbs. Okay? So we can, and uh, should I list it again? Well, yeah, all right. So uh, there's a, in the last pictures here, I don't know if you can see it, but those are, uh, um, it's very simple. It's, pla it's plastic bag, I hate it, anyway, but, what they do, and there are some, uh, there are some research, and again, that's a Rodale Institute that uh, does that. But you take your compost when it's all finished, right, in the cold uh, uh, stage, right? My compost, like after two years, you put that in bags, and then you plant a type of forbs, right? They, there, it's a grass, right, a native grass, and those native grass. They will find uh, uh, the fungus that say, you know, there might be only one or, or spores of that abruscular fungus uh, that roll in, uh, in that compost or thing like that. The plant will find them and grow that on their roots. So you grow those plants through the summer in those bags. Then you cut the, the top off and you keep the roots there and chop them and chop that. And then you mix that in your garden. And you have, then you, you inoculate that arbuscular fungus. And not only it's an uh, arbuscular fungus that, uh, you know, uh, help the plant grow, but also there are indigenous microorganisms. Because what you want is not to go, like uh, go to some company, you know, and then order, you know, some uh, uh, probiotic for your compost or whatever. You can just go in place where you have prairie remnant. You know, because that's what you want. You see, if you have a, uh, you do an orchard or thing like that, you might go into the woods because you would want uh, uh, fungus that goes with trees, right? But for all the the garden, what you want is is a, a, a prairie fungus that average color. So you want a prairie plants, and you want to create your compost through that thing. Last thing, promise, is biochar. All right, so biochar, and this is a fascinating story, another fascinating book called 1491 by Thomas Mann, right? that uh, came out like 20, 25 years ago, that told us, he's the guy, you know, he's a science writer, and he put into a book everything that was being discovered at that time from pre-1492. What was there, you know? How many people were there? You know that uh, um, up until now, the people that told that story are European white male anthropologists and, uh, you know, scientists or whatever that told that story. They say, oh yeah, uh, uh, people from the uh, Turtle Island, they only came here 10,000 years ago, blah, 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 right? Now, there have been tons of research that have debunked all that stuff. And one of them is very interesting. It's about Terra Preta, Black Earth. And that's from the Amazon Basin. In the Amazon Basin, you know, you have the rainforest, you know, uh, all of that. They thought that nobody ever lived there. But actually, because of those Black Earths, they realized that they were actually gigantic cities there. But there was no stone to build cities, you know, and, and pyramids or whatever. Everything was built out of wood and stuff. So, on, and it rotted, you know, immediately. And people died, you know, of course, with uh, uh, 
uh, colonization and all of that. The disease went out uh, ahead. So when the, the white came to Brazil, so like that, oh, there's just a few people there that way, a few people that way, because that's who was left. And uh, back then, when they arrived there, all those cities were gone. But then they went, of course, you know, people are always digging, and they found this black earth. And that black earth, they could bag it and sell it, man. <laughs> the people that never had enough. And what they discovered is that black earth that fed those cities. And so again, uh, the, the, the rainforest is like here. There's no soil. It's very, very cool. It's all sandy. It gets washed down by uh, 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 floods every year by the Amazon River. But actually, everything up. The way people figured out is that they made all the compost, you know, all the the, the feces, the the food, and stuff like that. They turned that into compost, but then they added biochar, and biochar is a charcoal uh, made out of wood, you know, like wood charcoal uh, that uh, you use for your barbecue, right? and. It's, you have to think of it like lava rock. It's, a, it's very, uh, uh, there's millions of pores, you thing like that. And when you mix that with your compost, those microbes that are there find a refuge in that biochar. And even if it rains and you have a flood and anything like that, they, they stay in there. And it's very interesting. The, the soil, they even found that they were, uh, making pottery intentionally to break it to mix with that stuff because they needed also something more than sands to hold the stuff together so they get washed up really like that so they were actually baking pottery to mix with the soil uh, um, so anyway i'm telling you all of this because i really think that there is a future in money in making compost and value added if you make a compost that has Indigenous microorganisms that you have captured, you know, mixing your compost, that you had biochar and all that. You have something that's a, that's better than gold, right? Uh, uh, that's what I think, and that you can use for uh, uh, starting plants, or, you know, for your your gardens and all of that. So that's where I hope compost is, is going. You know, I'm going to experiment myself with, uh, you know, uh, the forks, you know, those plants. Uh, that's something we will tell you at the school. Biochar, uh, I really like to make, figure out a way, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's not easy to make. So anyway, uh, I hope, uh, That's um, great. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop the recording. Yeah, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to see if anybody um, 